and Solidarities, which is a panel discussion we have uh, organised around the generative new book by Therese Johnson, Innocent Subjects, Feminism and Whiteness, published by Pluto Press last year. My name's Sarah Keenan, and I co-direct the Centre for Research on Race and Law with Nadine Elanani, who has also done a lot to make this evening's event happen. So I first met Therese in 2007 at a weekend gathering of the now defunct Feminist Activist Forum, or FAF, in Manchester, uh, focusing on the No Borders movement and migrant solidarity. We ran for the train to London together uh, at the end of the weekend, and I've been seeing Therese at anti-racist coalitional actions from Yarlswood to Grenfell to outside Australia House and at many other places since then. So Therese has long been not only asking the question of how to build a coalitional feminist movement, but also actively uh, herself attempting to, to do so for a long time. As we'll hear tonight from our brilliant panel of speakers, who I will introduce shortly, Theresa's book examines the history of feminism and focusing on British feminism over the last 40 years. Therese argues that black feminism's role in shaping the movement has been marginalized through narratives which position white women at the center of the story from the women's liberation movement in the 1970s up until today. And I think that this is valuable for so many reasons, but uh, one of those is that I think many of us might be aware of that racist marginalization in the American uh, US feminist movement, um, but British uh, history hasn't been as widely discussed, particularly outside of academia uh, in that respect. Analyzing the ways in which whiteness continues to pervade feminist literature as well as feminist debates in the liberal media, Therese demonstrates that despite an increased attention to race, intersectionality and difference, stories told by white feminists are shaped by their desire to maintain an innocent position towards racism. I'm hugely grateful to Therese for writing this book and for the three amazing panelists who are here with us this evening to discuss it and the themes emerging from it. So we're going to first hear from Tanya Sarissia, who is someone I'm fortunate to have as a colleague here at Birkbeck, a soon to be confirmed as reader in the criminology department at the School of Law. Tanya's research explores the cultural politics of sexuality and sexual violence from a feminist and queer perspective. She has published widely on feminism, sexual assault and survivor politics, including in her critically acclaimed 2018 book, Speaking Out, Feminism, Rape and Narrative Politics. And if you enjoyed Teresa's book but haven't read Tanya's, uh, you'll enjoy Tanya's book. Um, Tanya is also involved in many grassroots campaigns and uh, is currently our UCU branch president. Uh, we'll next hear from Sita Balani, who is a lecturer in contemporary literature and culture at King's College London. Sita's research seeks to unpack the impact of imperial histories on contemporary culture, and she's the author of numerous academic and non-academic articles, as well as being a co-author of the recent book Empire's Endgame, Racism and the British State, also published by Pluto. Sita is also involved in various anti-racist grassroots campaigns um, and I know that she's been a key figure in organising against Prevent in Universities and its normalisation of Islamophobic surveillance and marginalisation in higher education. And finally, um, Gail Lewis, who probably needs no introduction for most of us here. Gail is a sociologist who specialises in psychosocial studies of race and gender, as well as a Tavistock trained uh, psychotherapist. Presently a visiting senior fellow at the LSE, Gail will be visiting professor at Yale University, Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies this coming academic year. Gail is the author of so many important works of anti-racist feminist thought. These are too numerous to mention, but as a mixed race feminist myself, I don't think I've ever been as personally affected by an academic article as Gail's piece, Birthing Racial Difference, Conversations with My Mother and Others, which is published in Studies in the Maternal. Gail is a longstanding member of Brixton Black Women's Group and a co-founder of the Organization for Women of African and Asian Descent. 
Um, so once again, just to remind everyone that this event is being recorded, um, but I will um, perhaps remind you again before we go to questions and I'll invite Tanya to kick us off. OK, um, hello everyone. I'm so glad to see so many people here to talk about this excellent book. And I mean, that's the first thing that I want to say. It's an excellent, excellent book. If you haven't read it, you should. Um, Therese asked us to talk about kind of the topics that she raised around feminist solidarities and complicities more generally. And that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to do it in part because, as Therese says in the book, you know, it is important to think about the kind of located histories that we have in our specific contexts and the history of um, feminism in Britain, in the UK is not actually my history in terms of what I know about. I'm Australian. You know, most of my work has been done on the lands of the Gadigal and the Wadri people, lands that were stolen and have never been ceded. And so I don't know the story that Therese revisits and analyzes so cogently as well as <laughs> anyone else on this panel. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about is the fact that in reading the book, I was, you know, able to revisit things that I've thought about for a long time with new insight. And since reading the book, there have been many moments and many kind of problems where I've returned to the book and it's framing to think about kind of contemporary problems um, and issues within feminism and particularly with um, what Therese refers to as white centered feminism. So I want to, I suppose, kind of speak about the book in the sense of how much it contributed to my thinking, the things it reminded me of and the things that it made me think a little bit differently about. And I got a bit carried away when I was thinking about it, so I'm going to try and keep myself to time to let um, other people come in. But it's really a tribute to how much um, how much value I found in this book in terms of kind of how much I would like to talk about it. So Therese offers in some ways a historical account, but it could also be described, I think, as a genealogical account or a revisiting of, you know, a history of the present, but also an insistence that the present does not have to be this way, that it might still be different. So it tells a story of repeated marginalization and erasure of the contributions of black British feminists and feminists of color by what Therese refers to as white centered feminism but it never loses sight of the possibility of feminist solidarity. And I think one thing that I actually found very useful in the analysis was that where Therese talks about the way in which white centered feminism continually casts black feminist critiques and critiques of other women of color as something in the past, something accounted for. It reminded me actually of one of the kind of central contributions of um, what we might call white centered or mainstream British feminism around post feminism, where feminism itself is viewed as already taken into account and unnecessary with the problems it identifies located in a past less enlightened era. And so it was useful to me to think about those parallels that Therese charts with the way that same process of locating in the past as um, describing as already accounted for is used to marginalize the political critiques and the political work of feminists of color and black feminists particularly. And I think that staying with the title of the book and Therese's you know, insistence that the allure of kind of whiteness is figured through innocence, I think she really shows the kind of, you know, the allure and the trap of innocence for kind of normative white femininity really beautifully. Um, and Jackie Wang and others have written about this and it really reminded me of her work when we look at the way in which innocence itself is figured as a kind of sweetener or something to aspire to, but very much bound up with the strictures, you know, the normative um, relations of white femininity and that the price of claiming innocence in an unjust society is almost inevitably complicity, as Johnson shows. And I think that she really shows that this has left white feminism and white centered feminism in an unproductive cycle and also with an inability to grapple with the structural power of race and the need, as Therese puts it, to abandon claims to innocence, to think about complicity and to do the work of solidarity. And I think it's that possibility of solidarity 
only through facing, you know, looking in the face, the history and ongoing legacies of complicity that really gives the spark to the book. And I think it's that that's that kind of magical spark that exists within feminist politics at its best. And um, so that's really the kind of framing for the issues that I wanted to talk about in terms of what it reminded me of. And I guess it really made me return to some of the debates around white innocence and white aggression that have taken place within Australia and the inability of kind of white centered feminism and white feminists within Australia to engage with the political critiques and the political contributions of Indigenous women and Indigenous feminists. And so reading the book made me think a lot about the contributions of Eileen Morton Robinson in what's a very foundational work of hers in Australian feminism, talking up to the white woman. And also the work that she did afterwards in an interesting article where she revisited the responses to the book. And she talked about how white critics and particularly white feminist critics were unable to respond to her work. And so I just want to read a little bit about what she said. She said, I'm interested in exploring how whiteness opens up and forecloses certain ways of reading the Indigenous other. I've been informally cautioned by white feminists that this article would be perceived as the response of an angry black woman who is once again demonstrating poor etiquette. Displacement is an interesting thing, as it is the anger of white women which becomes identified as mine, rendering visible an oppressive history and an ungrateful native. Living in the white hegemonic nation, which is also the object of my research, it seems this accusation is made about anything I write. Recently, a critic of my Australian Research Council grant application stated that my work is driven more by political considerations than by a spirit of intellectual inquiry, as though everyone else in the academy is able to pursue their work free of such political considerations. I'm sure that talking up has fulfilled the fantasy of many white women who desire my anger and disingenuously figure themselves as victimized objects of it. And writing at about the same time, Sarah Ahmed speaking about kind of repeated and ongoing inability of white centered feminists in Australia to respond to indigenous feminism, talked about moving from the question of who is enabled to speak to who is enabled to know. And she says that a more enabling politics of knowledge for feminism would be one that welcomes those voices that refuse to speak with or to speak nicely to the one who knows. And she said such a welcoming of those who refuse assimilation would be about opening up the possibility of a knowledge which does not belong to the privileged community and hence which contests the boundaries by which that community is formed. It would mean accepting the limits of the knowledge that one has already claimed. It would mean unlearning the response to those descending voices which can hear those voices only as hostile. It would mean reading the contributions by black feminists as a gift to white feminism. If white feminists could begin to receive that gift and speak to those others who will not be assimilated into an epistemic community, then a dialogue may yet take place. In other words, in receiving that gift, white feminism would not be forced into silence. Silence is a perverse response as it refuses responsibility for one's implication, not only in the debate, but in the power relations that were at stake in that debate. And those two contributions came back to me repeatedly as I was reading the book. And I think that the book actually is really resonant of that approach that Ahmed says of rejecting the kind of victimized positionality of the white feminist and instead thinking about what it would mean to see the contributions of indigenous or black women and feminists as a gift. And I think Johnson really models what such a kind of adequate reception and response to that kind of work, to seeing the generosity in it, to seeing the respect, to seeing the necessity to accept the limits of knowledge and to think differently. And I think that that's one of, you know, what's really valuable about the book at the same time that, in a sense, it almost re-offers that gift and does the work of drawing attention to it and of drawing attention to the ways in which it was um you know responded to with an inadequate recognition and through failings and so i think in that sense as she begins to ask about solidarity you know the book itself offers a model as i say of what it would mean to receive and also to do the work to represent that gift and to insist on the political necessity 
of an adequate engagement with it. And it also reminded me of the point that Ahmed makes around knowledge and um, epistemology. So as the book makes clear, there's actually a lot of intellectual labor in maintaining the kind of blindnesses of white centered feminism. And so at one point, Johnson quotes Heidi Mercer and says that, you know, whiteness is that powerful place that makes invisible or reappropriates things, people and places it does not want to see or hear. And then through misnaming, renaming or not naming at all, invents the truth. What we are told is normal, neutral, universal, simply becomes the way it is. And Mertzer also points out, as Johnson quotes, that it makes no sense that if white centered feminism can understand a complex structure like patriarchy, that it would struggle to understand the political structures of whiteness. And I think that what Johnson's book shows as you read it and read her careful analysis of the intellectual work that takes place, that it's not so much a struggle as there is a history within white centered feminism of doing that work, of refusing, of refusing that gift, of working to maintain an intellectual construction that says it is possible to understand patriarchy without grappling adequately with whiteness, without understanding race. And that definition of patriarchy or sexism as something that can even be conceptualized as separate from other power structures is an intellectual construct of the kind of white centered feminism that Johnson analyzes and the kind of expertise that she talks about in the structures of whiteness in the academy, in mainstream media like The Guardian. And for me, thinking about that, about the work and the effort and the labor that is goes into um, white ignorance, as Johnson discusses, is actually really useful then in thinking about complicity, but then also thinking about what a feminism could be like that would do different kinds of work, that would invest itself in other and different intellectual projects. And um, that also, let me tell you, as I say, these are, you know, a number of kind of um, hopefully points that will be interesting to take up in discussion. But the point that Wendy Brown makes that the claim to innocence within feminism is often about a refusal of power, a refusal of politics, or as Johnson puts it, a refusal of accountability. And so Wendy Brown talks a lot about tendencies within feminism and particularly kind of mainstream white feminism to prefer to frame things in terms of morality rather than politics, to position oneself as an innocent victim of kind of bad forces rather than grappling with feminism, feminist activism, feminist intellectual work as something that has real effects in the world, you know, that changes the conditions under which it operates and that which does actually seek to change the world within certain ways. And if we seek to change um, you know, gender or sexism while denying the realities of racial power, then we're changing the world, I think, as Johnson really effectively shows, in a way that upholds those structures and upholds the dominance of whiteness. And this reflects the politics within feminism as well and the efforts that it takes to center certain perspectives and to marginalize voices that ask feminism to be and to do something different. And so the final kind of two points that the book made me think about are points that I have, you know, returned to actually over several years, and they really made me think a lot more and a lot differently about them. And it's about feminism itself. And in a sense, the question of, you know, feminist capaciousness, you know, or the urge to try to make as um, Ian Ang writes, and as Johnson quotes Ang, feminism a natural political home for all women, rather than potentially expect, um, accepting that maybe the project is to accept the partiality or even to provincialize aspects of feminism or the feminist project. And in that sense, I think that drawing again on Ang, the point that Johnson makes about looking at the moments of failure as useful starting points, rather than always looking for moments of incorporation and unity is also really important for thinking solidarity. Um, and so finally, it also made me think of Emi Koyama's work on disloyalty 
to feminism and whether you know the investment in feminism itself at times actually precludes a real political commitment to the forms of solidarity that would be able to contest the structures of power that make feminism a necessary political movement in the first place. Um, so yeah, so <laughs> in summary, it made me think a lot. Um, you should definitely read the book. Thank you, Thank you. so much, Tanya, um, for that, yeah, really close reading, um, connecting to so many um, different bodies of literature. Um, Sita, would you, are you ready to unmute? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much uh, for the invitation to speak on this panel. Um, I was really delighted to see this book in the Pluto catalogue. Um, I've known Therese for a long time. I think of Therese as someone from a kind of, who I might encounter in a sort of DIY feminist space as much as in its academic counterpart someone I used to run into at parties when those were still a thing uh, and when the North-South London divide was more regularly and easily conquered. So I feel really delighted to be able to join in this conversation between comrades and fellow travellers and I hope it's a precursor to other conversations, hopefully offline with a drink after a feminist book fair or at the nervous beginnings of a protest holding coffees and hoping for a big turnout. So I hope those days are returning to us soon and we can continue the conversation there. I'm going to talk a little bit about the book. Um, you should all see it, by the way. It's really excellent cover. Um, it will look good on your shelf, so you should also buy it. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what I found striking in it and then suggest some ways in which the analysis might be applicable to some very recent events. So it's the subjects charts the now familiar cycles of denial, refusal, recrimination and false triumph that attend the story of racism in the feminist movement in Britain. The book takes a long, clear-eyed look at these cycles and it examines the way in which issues of racism are endlessly deferred that kicked into the long grass of what Therese refers to as the perennial next time. It shows the way in which the refusal of an anti-racist feminism in favour of one which maintains the comforting illusion of innocence, unity and sisterhood has prevented an honest and sincere reckoning with the history of feminist struggle in this country. The book, I think, invites us to begin this reckoning. It doesn't offer a formula, but it does demonstrate an approach. And it's an approach that attempts to stay with the difficulty of feminism's imbrication with the fatal politics of imperialism and nationalism. And it's clear that we need to forge new practices of struggle. But I think the book also makes it equally clear that we need to learn to think about the past more honestly and more carefully, and that we need to attend to the past. And if we don't attend to it, it will return in ways um, that we cannot manage. And I think there's a suggestion here that we have to be accountable to the past, but not for it, in order to build a different kind of feminism that might make a new future more habitable, like more habitable for all of us. So I'm going to contrast two of the sources that um, Therese kind of spends some time with um, and then think about how they might help us to understand uh, some recent events. So one of the powerful aspects of this book, I think, is the time it spends with archives of feminist writing that are usually sidelined or ignored. So those of you who've been on the call who will have uh, who spent some time reading about feminist history or indeed were part of these histories would have seen spare rib and sometimes red rag mentioned uh, in many, many histories. In fact, spare rib is really often the kind of go to place to be like, what were feminists saying about X in X year? That's where you go. Uh, but Outright is much less frequently mentioned. So Outright Women's Newspaper was published by a multiracial collective from 1982 to 88. And as Therese notes, while conventional accounts of the women's liberation movement see the 70s as its high point and the 80s as the beginning of a period of rockiness, rupture and demise, Black British feminism thrived in the 1980s and outright was one of the spaces for its negotiation and development. The newspaper was dedicated to covering political campaigns from an internationalist position. It was critical of imperialism, of colonialism, of racism, capitalist exploitation and sexism. And I wondered, reading Theresa's account of some of that 
work, where my own knowledge and understanding would be if I'd read the outright archive rather than perhaps uh, some of the other things that I read when I was learning about the history of feminism. I certainly wonder what would have happened if I read the outright archive rather than scrolling through Twitter. So Theresa's analysis suggests that in its internationalism, in its multiracial collective, in its commitment to an anti-imperialist, anti-capitalist critique, we might find an alternative history of struggle. And so I think one of the things that I've taken from this is actually the kind of urgency with which um, we might need to begin that process, the urgency with which we might go and do that reading and really kind of bring those sources back to life. Um, and I think Therese really points us to doing that and leave some space for other people to take to take that up. Um, and I read that section of the book on the same day as the mass, or the day after, I think, the mass resistance to the raid, the immigration raid in Glasgow. And this extraordinary, moving, beautiful act of collective, multiracial neighbourliness, a kind of homemaking direct action, garnered significant news coverage and social media commentary, much more so perhaps than everyday acts of resistance usually do. So. I remember a few years ago, uh, the Home Office had to release some data. And in fact, it turns out that immigration raids are disrupted all the time. So people might remember other instances, um, one that I think of often uh, if I'm having particularly a day of real pessimism is an immigration raid being disrupted in Whitechapel, someone slashing the tyres of the van and then the local car mechanics refusing to replace them. So they are, of course, these everyday acts of resistance. But this example um, in Glasgow really did garner people's attention um, and really gave a kind of new energy to the movement against the hostile environment, against border regimes and against the state terrorism of immigration raids. But in 40 years, when the links are dead and Twitter has morphed into something even worse, I wonder if it will be possible to recover this example of solidarity winning the day in a time of mass complicity with authoritarianism and racism. Will this story be one we turn into part of our collective mythology? And is that better or worse than it being forgotten? And what are the stakes here of its recollection in 40 years? And what are all the everyday acts of solidarity, all of the everyday wins that might be documented in the archive um, and something like the outright archive that I've never gone and sat down and read. And I wondered how we might attend to this largely ignored archive of resistance documented by this multiracial collective of women in 1980s to transform our own understanding of both past and present. And how might doing so help us to make the resistance uh, in Glasgow the rule rather than the exception? But just those were some kind of thoughts that came together around that, the, the various sections of the book in which the outright archive uh, is, I think, really usefully brought to the fore by uh, Theresa's writing. And this is, I think, in sharp and productive contrast to the analysis in the book of The Guardian. So um, I think Therese rightly resists the kind of snarky commentary that I would no doubt have been very tempted to include and lets, uh, lets material really speak for itself to really great effect, I think. So I think she really shows the way in which the Guardian com comment pages act as the mouthpiece for a denuded liberalism, more perhaps of a sustarmerous centrism than a genuine political project. And that this empty, remainery, starmerist liberalism acts as a kind of gatekeeper. It acts as a kind of arbitration device for feminism, which determines which ideas and which voices can be elevated and pumped into the mainstream. So thinking about The Guardian and thinking about Theresa's really insightful, I think, analysis of quite what work that publication does uh, in determining the shape of feminist discourse as it enters the mainstream, right? What quite what work it does as a set of gatekeeping devices. Um, thinking about these things together really made me reconsider some recent uh, events. So I'll talk through them quite briefly uh, before handing on to Gail. So back in April, many of you will recall uh, a young woman named Sarah Everard was abducted and murdered by PC Wayne Cousins a police officer with the Metropolitan Police who has since pled guilty, pleaded guilty. 
Uh, but in, before this, in the days following the recovery of her body, a vigil was planned in Capham Common, where she was last seen prior to her abduction. The vigil was planned by a new group called Reclaim These Streets, uh, a small group of women from the area. Under police pressure, however, the organisers uh, called off the vigil. Knowing that many would turn out anyway, Sisters Uncut stepped into the breach and ensured that the vigil went ahead with something resembling an organised, politicised feminist presence. And many of you will remember the violent police suppression of the protest um, and the images of that, I think, were quite shocking to a lot of people, though for many, these were uh, much more familiar, perhaps. Some of you might also remember that in response to calls for Cressida Dick to resign in the wake of this police suppression, organisers of Reclaim These Streets refused to echo this demand, saying that they didn't want to contribute to a pylon uh, of the most senior woman in the Met to date. I think just thinking about that um, after reading um, the account in Innocent Subjects of the Reclaim the Night marches and the way in which um, women of colour really refused the logic of a kind of resort to policing as a mode uh, that would apparently keep women safe. So I think these debates are um, have been happening over and over again. We've seen them occur and recur dozens of times, but it was really stark, I think, for me to read the very detailed account um, of those events in Leeds and thinking about how similar they were to what we've seen more recently. And I think there's some ways in which we might think about reclaiming these streets as not just reflective of the sort of politics that Therese documents in The Guardian, but actually as kind of produced by The Guardian. Kind of like a weird, if The Guardian could make people, it would have made this. And the organisers include several Labour councillors and a public relations executive. So they are, I think, in lots of ways, that project is a sort of epitome of what Therese calls white-centred feminism. And crucially, this is a feminism that can speak the language of intersectionality. This is a white-centred feminism that might well have black and brown women involved, maybe trans women and non-binary people, but it ultimately cannot transcend its investments in innocence in the world as it currently stands. And of course, in contrast to this quite stark contrast, we've seen the emergence of a movement to kill the policing bill. Um, and I think what's interesting about, about this is that it has really been, uh, solidarity has been its watchword from the jump. And so it's one that doesn't just decenter the kind of white woman figure, but actually decenters all racial subject positions, including marginalised ones, in favour of a politics that doesn't begin from imagining a specific political subject as its centre, but tries to begin with something more capacious, that assumes that this policing bill will affect multiple groups in different ways. And as such, there cannot be the kind of perfect subject of the campaign. There has to be uh, a politics of coalition, a politics of solidarity, um, a politics of world making together uh, that tries to glimpse a different kind of future. So those are just some of the things that kind of um, I felt reading this book alongside the, the struggles that continue every day, uh, of which a sort of, I think, a, a more generative feminist set of feminist possibilities are being kind of um, made in the moment. And so I think it was useful for me to read those on the book together and see, um, see where that took my thinking. So I hope some of that was of some interest um, and I will hand over to Gail now. But thanks so much, uh, Therese, for all your work on this and for everyone who organised the event. Thanks so much, Sita. Um, and so finally, yeah, over to you, Gail. Oh, hi. OK, thank you. Um, thank you very much for inviting me um, to be part of this conversation. Uh, thank you, Therese, for writing the book. Um, and I think what I want, I want to talk, talk about some of my responses to it, but first just kind of lay out the things that struck me about the book. Um, and I'm hoping that maybe some of the things that, I, that were in my mind kind of resonate with some of the things that we've heard from um, Tanya and Sita. So we, we'll see um, slightly differently. And I should start, I guess, by saying that I was when I was invited to participate and I thought, oh, it's great the book's out. 
and then I thought, but I'm too tired. I'm too tired to look again <laughs> and see everything that's been going on for the last 40 years and kind of live it again, because I've been in those 40 years, unlike most people here, I guess. So there was something that was, there was a, a, an initial resistance just because of a tiredness. But of course I overcame that and it was a delight to read the book. Some of the tiredness remains because yes, indeed, the repetitions are exhausting. The ways in which you think, so the thinking about what you just were referring to, Sita, about the Reclaim the Night marches and the, the beautiful, it's great that you've got the quote in there um, from Kum Kum, uh, Kum Kum Bhavnani, who talks about in very subtle and complex ways, but very direct ways about the ways in which whiteness, whiteness as a project, as a, as a practice of living rather than white skinned people, the ways in which whiteness was just infused in those marches. And we did protest them all the time, but it's great that you've reproduced Kum Kum's statement about that because we can see it so clearly. And the way that's juxtaposed to the innocent claims of, oh, but we didn't ask for more policing. Irrelevant. What you were doing already summoned more policing of black bodies by everybody because whiteness is a policing of blackness, of a policing of, of colourness. That's part of what it does. And so the ways in which I read the book was to think about, well, with one mind, one part of my mind was to think about the ways in which white centred feminism of the time, and it seems continuing, is a way to kind of police, attempt to police or to enclose, to, 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 to enclose in a sense of imprison um, black and of color feminisms by designating in a particular way that you lay out so beautifully, Therese. Okay, but that, but uh, so in that sense, I think we need to think about it as linked to an abolitionist sensibility to say that there's a way in which the uh, what you beautifully do, and I was really captivated and thought was really important by showing the ways in which white centered feminism resists anti racist critique. And what was important for me, old lady here, for showing the ways in which it continues to do that, but in its different forms now. The denial was always there in that, in that sense, but now the kind of inevitability, you know, the way you point to. The, the whole framing in which it's inevitable to come. There's an essentialization that happens that feels to me to be of this moment, of this post-state multiculturalism moment that says the state version of multiculturalism shows us that nothing can happen because these bad black and brown people who will never really toe the line, no matter how much we invite them to, and now we're going to chuck them out again anyway. We'll continue to do that. But the ways in which that, that project of the inevitability of whiteness somehow summoning feels to me to be of this moment, as opposed to it couldn't have been in the moment before because the state orchestration of, a dis of discourses and practices of race weren't the same. So my point there is, is simply to say that I read this with a lot of excitement about the ways in which you locate this, not just in the context of a nation state called Britain, but in a moment in time that draws our attention, calls on us to do the work to say, how does this white centered feminism articulate to a particular kinds of product pro projects of governance and its violences? And although you don't, that's, they're not your terms, it seems to me that's summoned by what you do. And that, that was really, really important, as well as the documentation you, you offer for the detailed um, examples you give, you know, like the Kum Kum Bhavnani kind of statement. I think in showing those, the continuity, the kind of shifting continuity um, and its locatedness is really important. And you show so powerfully the stuff that we know because we live it, we live its violence. But 
just its durability, the way it feels like this thing, this phantom of whiteness, this, this ghostly power barricading of whiteness just can keep on going. See, remember I'm saying I'm tired, I'm coming from, you know, I don't have the energy that I, well, I, I kind of do, I think, but there's a way in which I don't start from the place of energy because it's like, please no more of this, I can't have any more of this. Okay, so there's something that's really important about that. And the way in which you show something that's very complex, you show, you make accessible because it's brought alive. It's brought alive in your analysis of the examples. It's not just the examples that bring it alive, it's your analysis that brings it alive of the ways in which whiteness works um, in, the, in this kind of feminism. So that was really, for me, they were all really, really important points about the book. And I thank you for. I found when I, when I was reading it, I also had a conversation with two, with, with Shaila Shah, who's one of the founders, the original founders of Outright, and Lilian Landor, who was then a very early member of setting up the, the newspaper. And I asked them, what was Outright about for you guys? And what was interesting was, was that they both said, although you describe it as, and it's been described in some of the current feminist literature as a multiracial racial kind of collective, they say, they say they would never have de defined it in that way, not because that wasn't the la language of, of now, but more because for them, the terminology, for the, the nominations of their work was black and third world. Now, of course, third world is a, ter is a naming that belongs to a Cold, War, a Cold War discourse. And it's shifted now post Cold War to global North and global South. But the point is, it was a black and third world and that was their project and that's who they define themselves as. And what I think is important about that is that it shows that it's possible for white skinned women to be in a project that names itself as black and third world and just get on with the work. Now, who knows what arguments happened in collective? We know collectives have arguments, but the point is they got on with the work and it was, its nomination was black and third world. And that seems to me to be an example that we need to hold on to because it speaks to what what the character of coalition work might look like or solidarity work might look like that we don't have to name ourselves in a in the in the language of governance multiracial we can call it through our own terminologies for them it was black and third world then what it might be now we'd need to think about but the point is there's already a severing of a naming um, connection to govern governance discourses and it was important for me to hear that from them and then they they talked as well about what they saw this was as absolutely as a newspaper intervening into feminist publications that was their aim to be part of the overall women's movement actually for Shiloh it was the overall women's movement and, and then Liliane also said that okay so and they saw black feminism and the black and third world women's movement in this country as part of the women's movement, but needing to do interventionist work to shift it out of its racism on the one hand, but also importantly to, wi to, to widen the feminist imaginary to say where are the locations of innovative feminist forms that we in this country can draw on, oh, they're actually in pl a places called the third world. And the idea was that they would bring to the newspaper examples of feminist activisms and theorizations from other places in the world, from Chile, from India, yeah, et cetera, from Palestine, et cetera, to bring to bear on the character of feminism in this country. So the direction of travel was from there to here, not from here to there. And that's really important point, I think, that we can hold on to now to think in, in, the, in a context of not just continuing decolonization, but decoloniality 
where we're trying to absolutely break up the very frameworks through which we know ourselves in the world, which are colonial discourses, including a discourse called gender, which is a discourse of coloniality. So, so that was important. So just going back to talk to the outright girls in that way was kind of interesting because it added to what was in the book for me and I wanted to bring to you. So it, we've got, what we've got is, is an incredible resource for thinking through the traveling through the history of someone from the younger generation in dialogue with their peers but also in dialogue with, if you like, my generation. And I wanted to make a comment about how important I feel that was, because Therese talks about critique as being incredibly, a, a site of generative possibility and generative production, actually. That crit from critique, we get something, the possibility of something new. And I want, when I was thinking about it, I, just in having that conversation with Shyla and Liliane, say about outright, prompted by what's in the book and thoughts that came in my mind, I thought another important thing that the book offers is the generative potential that emerges from intergenerational conversation. It's not just about a linear narrative of what was it like then and is it still the same, but it's rather what can we make differently now if we think ahead, by putting together our responses, my generation's responses, with your generation's responses to the challenges before us and making something new. And I think the book offers that too, actually, through its readership and through the relations that will happen through the readership into activism. There's something about the importance of generation, the, the generation of new, new horizons, new imaginaries, through the conversations between chronological generations, if you like, age generations. And that felt important to me. It's because I'm old and so I'm coming with those things. The other thing, though, that I wanted to, to and perhaps this is the last thing that I'll, I'll say at this point, um, is that I found myself thinking that, of course, the project of the book is to show the way in which white centered feminism continues to reproduce itself within the terms of whiteness as a practice and structure of power and doesn't do anything about that absolutely is happy to locate itself there and and is part of it and that therefore black feminist critique was a critique of that and what white white centered feminism does is to resist this as an anti-racist critique but I felt that I wanted to say that black feminism of 40, 30, 20 today isn't just a critique. It's also a site of production. It's the production of both a, a, a demonstration of the way in which black and, and of colour life goes on despite the tyrannies of whiteness, class, regimes of sexuality, or all of all of those things. Despite that, black and of colour life goes on in its own terms. It's below the radar and it goes on in its own terms. It's what Sylvia Winter, in talking about the plantation, talks about the, the new subjects, the different subjectivities that are demonstrated by producing in the provision grounds. And for people who don't know, the provision grounds were what the enslaved people did when they grew their own, they did in plantation work, but they also, particularly in Jamaica, they also grew their own provisions like yams and things in the ground, in little pieces of, of, of land that couldn't be given over to plantation, but there, and therefore were used for um, the enslaved to grow their own food. The travel between the bodies that were there on the plantation is one kind of subject position, of, of course, and through white eyes, one kind of subject. When they finish from the plantation and go and dig up their own provision, 
and make merry with each other and use that food. There's another subject, another subjectivity on offer here. It's the subjectivity out with of the economy of plantation production. Black feminism is also su such a sight. What we did then and what we continue to do now is to offer new forms of kind of blackness that may or may not be know itself as gendered, certainly doesn't know itself as raced in the in the terms that white centered feminism would, but it offers a new way of being. And it seems to me that a vital lesson that is on offer for white centered feminism, especially when we take it out of somewhere like Britain and think about all the feminisms around the world in this thing that we now call the global south that are demonstrating ways in which people are living in ways that show perhaps it's emergent personhoods, different ways of being, emergent personhoods and beings that escape, not entirely of course, but escape the terms of normativity and show possibilities of life and spring up in all forms of activisms, of course. That's when we that's when we see them, when the news decides to give five minutes to them and then drops it away again, but actually are going on living living lives in other ways. And it seems to me that that idea of construct, not crit critique, is a vital lesson that white centred feminism could take. But what's at stake for them to do that is really just put presenting to them how much they'd have to give up. That is unbearable for them to do so, to give up. But actually, we go on producing ourselves anew in emergent ways that might harness to another kind of politics. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gail, um, uh, for that beautiful response um, and to all the speakers. Um, Therese, would you like to um, make a few comments before we turn to uh, the audience? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Great, okay. So, <laughs> I actually dropped out of the call for, I'm really gutted, I dropped out of the call for like over f about five minutes of your talk, Gail. I'm, I'm really glad this is being recorded so I can <laughs> go back and revisit it um but yeah i just i'll just say a few things because I, I also I, I want there to be space for us to to have a conversation and for that to be with uh, with other people on the call as well um i mean first off just to say thank you so much um sita tanya and gail for for taking the time i feel so grateful and honored that you've taken the time to to read and engage with my book and Gail, what you say about the tiredness and the kind of toll of doing that, like I, I really, um, I hear that. And I mean, that, that was like part of, I guess part of my impetus for like doing that work was was hearing that, the, the exhaustion of that repetition. But I also see how like, even reading my book is like, <laughs> is also tiring. Um, and yeah i loved reading it i just need to say i love reading it. I'm talking about a response you know <laughs> yeah yeah no because of what you po point to of it just goes on yeah 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 exactly yeah and um and also thanks to sarah and nadine for for organizing this event and for encouraging me to um yeah to do this <laughs> um i really appreciate um that it that it's been an opportunity to or that it's it's about kind of engaging with the the broader ideas of the book um, and the themes of the book as well, um, and I really appreciate the that kind of engagement. Um, yeah, so much to say, so much to say and think about. I think it's it's slightly daunting to to reply <laughs> when I don't when it's I was like, how do I prepare for this event? <laughs> um, I, and knowing that you know you were all going to say like you're, you're three very smart people who have said a lot of very smart things, and I feel like um, you know 
it's something I'm going to need to kind of digest and, and reflect on what you've said. I'm not someone who kind of puts together my thinking really quickly. Um, but I think, I guess, to, to respond briefly to, to each of you, um, Tanya, I really thanks so much for for what you brought and um, like it was really interesting to hear about what what the book kind of brought up for you and in thinking about um, feminism in in Australia in a different location and um, I really liked um, that you picked up on the kind of the way you framed it around like the the intellectual labour that goes into producing ignorance. Um, I I really like the way that you put that and I think that's really um, it really speaks to that idea of um, like the way that, Ch that Charles Mills theorizes white ignorance as this kind of like faulty knowledge as it's something that um, is it's not an absence of knowledge it is a form of knowledge that um, that positions itself as kind of objective and neutral and as right and which in the process disregards and erases other forms of knowledge and of knowing um, and yeah, sorry, I'm slightly flustered by getting by getting thrown off the call. So apologies. Um, it's the worst moment for my internet to go down. But um, yeah, Sita, um, thank you so much. I found that really interesting. I I had a hunch when I was thinking about what what you might talk about that you would connect it to kind of contemporary um, mobilizations, um, particularly around. Um, you know, kill the bill um, mobilizations and what, um, like the potential of that in this moment. And actually, I've also been reading Empire's Endgame uh, recently, which both you and Nadine, of course, are co authors of together with a whole host of other great people. And I, I thought that was interesting as well. Um, like the, the, I, I kind of resonate with that hope that you express in there in terms of some some of the, the anti racist mobilizations like the broad based kind of grassroots anti racist mobilizations um, that are taking place in this moment. Um, and yeah, and also I really like thank you for um, bringing attention to outright. I mean, I, you know, I know outright from the archives. I know Gail knows outright <laughs> in a in a more intimate way, and I, I just um, it's just when I found it, you know, when I first heard of it, I I just found it so inspiring, and like that, that there was this whole other kind of archive that that's not talked about in terms of like the legacy of the women's liberation movement, and you know, it's a it's an anti-imperialist, anti-racist feminist archive. Um, which I think we can learn so much from, um, especially, you know, in this moment, it was, it was the 1980s in terms of a conservative government and um, and a racist government and the, the kind of all the activism around immigration. Um, there is this long legacy and tradition to draw on, which has been led by black feminists and feminists of colour. And I think, um, yeah, I, I, Thank you for highlighting that. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, I really, I will have to go back and listen to your whole talk, Gail. Um, and but I really, I really, what I did here <laughs> from at the start was around the, um, you know, the, the the policing and the way that whiteness polices. Um, blackness and how that was infused within the, the Reclaim the Night um, marches. And I really liked the way you were thinking about that in terms of like um, an abolitionist position and, and how we, you know, how that, that gives us another way of thinking about um, how whiteness functions um, in relation to the state. Um, and also I really hear, um, I'm really glad that you said that, you know, about um, you know, black feminism as a site of production. Uh, I think that's so important. And I think that 
it's definitely like a tension that I felt a lot in in writing my book because I think, you know, I I kind of said, you know, black feminism has a lot of trajectories and and roots and but but that's not how I'm engaging with it. So because that was that was not the because of because my focus was on the critique, and I can see how that um, like it it produces this tension because it does kind of reinforce this idea of black feminism as a critique of white feminism when it's when it's so much more than that. Um, so I really appreciate those comments. Um, yeah, I think it's already seven, so I think it's maybe we should <laughs> sure. move on. But just thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Therese. Um, yeah, and again, thank you so much um, to this excellent panel. Um, so I will give the speakers an opportunity to you know, continue the conversation. Um, but um, first, I want to invite uh, anyone who's in the audience, um, if you would like to ask uh, ask any questions or, or make a comment, um, you should be able to use the hands up function, which is um, at the top of the screen. Um, there's a little smiley face with a hand. Um, or you can also use the chat box and I'll come to you and you should now be able to you to unmute yourself and if you like turn your video on but sorry to also remind you again that uh, this is being recorded um so just be aware of that um yeah so would anyone like to uh start off the conversation I can start, but I'm worried. Oh, okay, no good. The hands function is working. <laughs> um, uh, now, how do I see who that is? Uh, sorry. Um, oh, it's Nadine. Hi. Yes, great. Hi. Um, yeah, I mean, I think also someone else may have put their mic on who, who would like to speak, but I'm not sure um, if people can't find the um, Lani was it maybe I'm not sure but if somebody wants to put in the chat maybe Sarah as well like if people yeah, are that might be that, that hand might be easier for me yeah so the, the hand function button should be three dots at the top um the right hand corner if you're on a laptop and then it should be there but anyway I think if people can also put questions in the chat if they don't want to use their mics or videos um or can't find the hand function do that but I can ask one for now while we wait for people to figure out the tech and um, but I, I thank you so much to all of you for your um, interventions and of course Therese for writing the book which 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 I think is great I, I suppose I wanted to ask um, considering you know Gail talked about the kind of feeling of being tired and I think all of us kind of found ourselves quite tired um, with some of the um, questions we were facing debates we were having conversations with friends comrades in the course of the Black Lives Matter demonstration when demonstrations when we kind of found that actually solidarities were harder to build in in one of the moments um, um, where we were seeing uh, kind of unprecedented levels of um, unprecedented protest and engagement with um, around questions of racism, but then actually building solidarities with people who maybe um, were not as um, familiar with the with organizing organizing or with um with the debates around um racism and building solidarity it actually kind of differences really became quite um defined and i suppose as someone who's interested in building solidarity and feels that you know the kind of solidarity we need is the um internationalist kind of solidarity the solidarity that does um work across borders across differences across identities you know in the face of being so tired and in the face of um you know, having these exhausting um, conversations with people, uh, you know, how do we build those kinds of solidarities? And when we talk about complicities, you know, can that lead to um, making those solidarities more difficult or alienating people who kind of then kind of burrow themselves away and feeling guilty or unable to say anything in case they um, are, you know, too privileged or appear too privileged and that. So, you know, those are the kind of questions I, I, I'm interested in. And I don't know whether, um, Therese, you, yeah, you, you kind of in, in writing the book, um, 
because I know you deal with these issues so carefully and so constructively and um, yeah I suppose it'd be interested in how how we build those the kinds of the, the really needed connectedness and solidarity we need urgently in this moment um, and don't get yeah, without losing sight of how damaging these complicities are um, and these erasures are, which of course we we should never do. And I think you've all highlighted how important they are. Because um, I think, you know, when Sita was talking about Kill the Bill, I was thinking, yeah, what an amazing uh, connected kind of solidarity we saw with that, how, you know, um, people across marginalized groups who are targeted by the, um, the bill, um, the police crime sentencing courts bill came together and you know that for me is an amazing instance of solidarity but then we also know um that we don't always have that kind of connectedness so how do we talk about complicities while also not losing sight of solidarities and building those solidarities etc i hope that makes sense sorry it's a bit rambled um therese uh would you like to respond or also anyone on the panel um can respond I mean, I can kick us off with a few comments. It's not, it's a, uh, it's a really great question. And it's one of those like really thorny, difficult, <laughs> ongoing issues, I think. And um, so what do I, I mean, I think, I think this idea of complicity, yeah, it's something that I've been thinking a lot about not just like when I was writing the book, but like in the last year, in the last year as well, and and in various different contexts. But like what I, you know, I draw in the book, I draw on Shireen Razat's work on complicity. Like I, I find it so useful, like the way she um, argues that um, you know the importance within feminist movements, and she's specifically talking about feminist movements and relationships between women on focusing on the ways that we are complicit in upholding each other's oppression. And I think, I don't know, maybe this feels like a bit of a theoretical answer, but I think that, that why that idea of complicity is important, I think it's both, there's something, you know, like we're all complicit in these systems all the time. Like we're always inside of, of, of these systems and it's in, impossible not to be complicit in a sense, but in like, I think in saying that there's a difference between saying that and then be, like leading to this kind of inevitability like we're we're always complicit so what can we do but also it in a sense it can help to like lower the defenses um and I guess that that's what I what I've been think what I think about in relation to the the idea of white innocence in particular like if we start with that and Sarah Ahmed writes about that as well as complicity as a starting point and we look at those ways that we are um we're kind of imbricated in 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 these systems of oppression and if we work where you know where we are complicit is often where we have more power to change things um so i don't i don't know if i'm really answering your question to be honest but i think like that um like working with that idea of complicity it's not like saying that someone is complicit or like presenting a critique it's not kind of saying like you should feel guilty or you should feel awful about this but like that's that's what happens right and that's a problem but if we can um yeah if we if we start from that point that we are we are complicit in these ways but how can we like work towards changing that um it kind of lowers the the defences, I think, but yeah, I'll, I'll pass it on. Um, would anyone else um, like to respond to that? Gail? Yep. Sita wants to go. Go, Sita. Um, all right, I'll be super quick. Um, probably some people on this call have heard me say this already, so I apologise if that's true. But I think that that's one of the things about the big mobilisations in the summer that I think is worth thinking about is that lots and lots and lots of young, and not just young, but like lots of white people came out on the street and they said, I don't want to be part of this project. So there's been this kind of authoritarian project building that is almost entirely reliant on a kind of aggrieved whiteness, right? Almost entirely reliant on interpolating people as white subjects. So it knows 
that the value of the wages of whiteness are falling. It knows that. Everyone knows that, right? And so the idea is to make the kind of white subject want to recover the lost value that it feels has been taken by people of colour, right? So when people say, like, I feel like an immigrant in my own country, they don't actually just mean that there are too many of us here. They also mean, I feel like I am being treated as immigrants have been treated, and I feel that I'm entitled to more, right? And I think this is the politics that this kind of aggrieved nationalist authoritarian project has been trying to build. But actually what we saw is really many thousands of, of people, of white people, people who are supposed to be interpolated by that project, come onto the street and say, I don't want any part of this. Now, that doesn't mean I don't think that they have done, as, as the women in the Outright Collective um, did, as, as affiliated themselves with a, with the project of, of Black and Third World kind of liberation. I don't think that, I think that would be utopian and too simple. I think that takes more than standing on the street with a bunch of other people. But I do think standing on the street and saying, I don't want to be part of that project is really powerful and important. Now, I think that the task of constructing a kind of collective political subject will take more. I think constructing collectively modes of being, as Gail puts it, that are generated through the horizon or against the horizon of justice or of freedom in a far more expansive way um, than we're seeing coming from, from the government, for example. But, you know, the government's watchword is freedom. The watchword of our opponents is freedom. So I think that if we want to recover a set of political possibilities that make people want to divest from the idea of whiteness, want to divest from their innocence, then I think we might have to think also about what, what kind of a construction of freedom, of liberation, of justice we have. Again, it's that project of what of, of, that goes beyond critique. And I think that what we saw, what we've seen with the protests in solidarity um, after the murder of the assassination of George Floyd, but also around Palestine more recently, is the possibility that people are saying, I don't want to be part of this. The question now is what we say about what they do want to be part of. And I think that's what we have to listen for and articulate and make space for and build. But I think that there is, is a moment in which the kind of hegemonic construction of whiteness is very very much more fractured than it might have been. And I think it's up to us to seize that. I, so I, I think in a way, you, Sita, you've said what's in my mind only more articulately, I think, in a way. But because what was in my mind, I was thinking precisely in those moments that you refer to, Nadine, what we have to be on the alert for is, is well, what's in play? Because it could be, for example, that people are out mobilising. And I thought about this when you gave the example, Sita, about the Glasgow mobilisation. It could be that that then all goes back into, oh, are we good white people? It could be. But I think you're right that you capture the difference between the moment when grievance or the fault line through grievance as the, the position of mobilisation, when actually what it's more and I am drawing on I, I am drawing on a um, a woman of colour psychoanalytic work who makes a distinction between grief and grievance. And when you grieve, you can grieve for everything that's been done in your name and has left you on the rocks. And you can maybe our challenge then is to say, do you see you're being undone? Do you want to reassemble into what your fantasy of what you were, or do you want to reassemble in some with us together in something that we don't quite know what the character of the reassembly would be, but we know it's not going to be this. So it's trying to find the fault lines that run through those those moments of big mobilization, the fault line that we can now say that Israel is an apartheid state. We might get hit for it, but more people will allow us to say it. Once upon a time, you'd be shot. And we need to make sure that we don't go back to that because the grief, it mustn't, the grief of what's undone by that mustn't turn back into grievance. And then it's like, oh, just give me everything back that you've stolen. And we need to be on the alert for government words because then there is freedom, Sita, but it's always allied to fairness. 
And fairness does a very different kind of work in terms of a politics of abolition. Abolition now of all for institutional forms and all the categories through which we know ourselves. Gender as a category, I think, needs to be abolished. That's, it. That's the logic of the, the project now, it seems to me. We need to abolish it. So all of those ways, we don't want to just reassemble. So we just sit back and say, OK, it feels OK now. The borders are back in place. It all feels a bit more stable. So following the fault lines and that needs, I think, the very the very listening that Therese talks about in the book. The listening to others, but the listening to ourselves, too. When I say I'm tired, what do I I need to listen to myself? What do I mean? Does that mean I can't be reanimated again by you guys? I can't run as fast as I could, but I can come out, you know, and this and the fault line. So it's those sorts of things. So I think it's the time we need to give ourselves also to calibrate the multiplicity of stuff that's going on in those moments of mobilization and see where we can go for something emergent and identify what needs to be got rid of or what might potentially come back to bite us. I think um, I don't have anything so much to add, but just to talk about, I think that maybe the pitfalls or the perils for, for feminists and for white centered feminism particularly. I mean, you know, Sita before was talking about the Kill the Bill movement. And I think that we kind of had a perfect example there of what um, Emi Koyama would talk about as disloyalty to feminism and, you know, a commitment to eradicating the conditions that require feminism, you know. So do you in the aftermath of those protests say, you know, you couldn't possibly criticize the most senior woman in the Met, or do you say, you know, it is state and police violence, you know, that works to enable, you know, and support these structures of violence more broadly. And I think, I think that's something um, that often kind of white centered feminism asks the wrong questions, you know, and I was thinking um, a little bit about um, Me Too, for instance, you know, and I think that there's often, um, in the aftermath of Me Too, you know, if women, others say, you know, that it hasn't affected them, that it's mainly for like, you know, rich white women, you know, the critiques of Me Too that are very valid. There's a question which is, you know, how do you expand Me Too so that everyone, you know, feels that it's for them? You know, but a different question is, you know, what are the underlying conditions that make that movement necessary? And that becomes a question about labor rights, you know, about structural racism, you know, about um, the devaluing of bodies and lives in all kinds of ways, you know, that exceeds, I think, the normal framework around Me Too. And so I think, um, yeah, I think particularly in terms of a kind of, you know, um, <laughs> the feminists who are seen to say could have been invented by The Guardian. I mean, it's about not asking those questions, but actually, you know, what are the questions, you know, what's the politics? that ultimately eradicates the need for this. You know, I think, you know, movements for liberation, you know, should be striving towards the eradication of their necessity. You know, as Gail said, you know, we abolish gender, we abolish gender oppression. You know, we don't kind of fight for a particularly privileged portion of femininity, you know, or for the rights of, you know, women who run the Metropolitan Police. Like, but I think, Tanya, you draw our attention to one of the moves that we need to be on the alert for because Me Too was appropriated. Mm. They didn't start it. <laughs> you know, it exactly. came from African an Amer African-American woman who said, look, I have a body that's called a, a gendered body mm. in, in, and is uh, can be sexually abused. Me Too in that sense. And it was appropriated. Yes. So it's exactly the same kinds of moves that need to happen. So it's the wrong questions, but the wrong questions that follow stealing. Yes. And reappropriating. Exactly. And, and, and which makes it a colonial project. Stolen people and stolen land. Mm. Yes, this is such an amazing <laughs> panel. Um, but thank you so much. Um, uh, yeah, just uh, um, sorry, I'm going to speak briefly while I wait. Please uh, get in touch with your questions. Um, uh, but that I mean, th this seems di disconnected, um, maybe, but it, I don't think it is. Um, but just what you were saying there, Gail, um, yeah, that the the wrong questions follow stealing, follow theft. Um, I, 
I've just been thinking about um, the, the, the British Museum and the types of knowledge that are produced by that large collection, which is just such that they just keep producing this knowledge and I um, they're just asking the wrong questions about it. And it's this um, structural situation where you just you can't produce good knowledge on the basis of theft, which is that that and um, and then not just theft, but the maintenance of theft, which, of course, is, you know, where we get into structures of settler colonialism, but also just the imperial project like, you know, Nadine's book shows just the 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 general sort of state of the world as it is now. Um, yeah, and uh, the other thought that I had while you were all speaking uh, in, in response to Nadine's question about complicity um, is, and uh, relating to something you said in your comments, I think, Tanya, at the start about the difference between taking a moral and a political position, because I think if the complicity is, is understood as a political one and not a moral one, then it has the capacity, it has a greater capacity to move into that shifting of subjectivity that Gail was speaking about. To the, I really um, liked that uh, term you use, Gail, of a, a, a emergent personhood. You, you know that the, these forms of subjectivities are possible when you are in a different relationship with the state and with power than white feminists tend to be. And if if they can see them, if they, we can see ourselves as complicit in, um, in a political rather than a moral sense, then it's not about feeling guilty or, you know, that um, kind of individualized moral quest to innocence as Theresa's work shows, but it, it can become part of an impetus towards a moral project to change the structures that enable that complicity. Um, yeah. Uh, who, who else would like to ask a question uh, or make a comment? I know there's many uh, brilliant minds in this virtual room. Um, Nadine, you're muted, you're muted. I was just going to say, um, I, I was just going to say I have a million questions, but I would, and I can fill the time, but I would just really <laughs> like to encourage the, you know, lengthy participant list to, um, I'm sure people have thoughts and ideas. I, I'm just, I'll just be the backup. I'm just letting you know I'm a backup. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, yeah, let, let's let the silence linger for a second to, uh, you know, um, please ask your question or make your comment. Okay, Nadine. <laughs> well, you don't sound too enthusiastic about having me back. I'm very enthusiastic. I just, I, yeah. I know, I know, but I, you know, I guess, you know, yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, Chris, yes, Chris, please. Um, would you like to unmute yourself? Great. This is solidarity just to say you're all wonderful people. I have so much respect and love for you. Um, yeah, really happy to be here. And I don't really have anything to add because Sarah, you summarized what my point was going to be, which was about the tension between or thinking about the individual, the moment in which we start talking about how do I feel, am I guilty, what complicity, how do I relate to what's happening? Then we fall, then we very easily lapse into this bad DIY of like oh let me read a book about how to be a good white subject because I identify as what you know how to be a good white subject and therefore we're in trouble you know both both politically but also ethically so then the question is so retaining that ethical political project um in a way that it's always relational I suppose and then we think about the ways in which 
that relationality manifests itself. But yeah, but basically, yeah, some thoughts. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks so much. Um, we have another uh, question in the chat, which is from Ruth Beecher, that it would be fantastic if Gail could say a bit more about the way in which white feminism brought the police into feminist protests, especially against sexual violence of the 1980s and how we do things differently. Um, and I know that um, Therese has also written about this, so if Gail, you feel too tired to go over it. Um... <laughs> I'm not that. <laughs> um, I, I think, I mean, in terms of the Reclaim the Night marches, there was, it was the ways in which the routes were agreed upon with the police about where feminists would march to to make the to make the claim that women have the right to be in the streets at night without subject to um, sexual harassment and threat um, but the routes that were chosen were very often those where black people people of color lived um, and where even if they didn't say we want extra policing for the march, although you always have to agree when you organize a march, you also always have to agree, get police permission and agree to an amount of policing that will happen. But even if they didn't want extra policing, they were saying already they were demarcating localities in a double move of threat to women. And those were localities that were already racialized as threatening and that were already always over policed anyway so over policing as a strategy particularly in the 70s and 80s actually that black i keep using black in the old term i mean black and asian and arab communities were always over policed anyway always ready to to, to run okay so then you say we're going to have a march through a, t a locality that's racialized as already out with the nation, already a threat to the British way of life. And then you layer into that, that women are threatened there in a way that they're not, if say in London, they walk in Hampstead, say, then you're, you're conjuring a framework of policing both in terms of an institution called the police, but you're also saying something about that locality needs to be surveilled in a particular kind of way, because it's not just that they all live there and they're threatening anyway, but now even our women can't walk through it. Now imagine, imagine you've got a mobilization of women in under the Women's Liberation Movement banner, say, yeah, who were a, one of the projects of that was to transform femininity, apparently, the ideas about femininity. And what you're saying is, is there's this guy called the Ripper going around in Yorkshire, really, really mutilating women. And the locations we're going to march is Chapel Town in Leeds only when he went all across Yorkshire and Lancashire. So it's policing in that double register of sense of an institution called the police and then the policing through a kind of analytics of what's the character of this locality. That means it's already a site of danger and what is it dangerous to and therefore what do we how do we need to surveil it. So that's really what I was referring to. But in um, in Therese's book. You know, she does a whole thing of mapping this out, showing the ways in which there was a policing mobilized and the denials of that because it was it was responded to as. But we didn't call for extra police to come on the march, you know, to protect to to be be called out as we did the march, as though that was all that was going on. As though there wasn't masses of mobilizations at the time by black communities, old style black people, okay, black communities against racist policing. That's what has been going on all the time. 
murders were happening of black people and of women, black men and women and of white women, let's put it that way, all the time. Now, it's interesting, and I wish I had it available to me now, because wages for housework, actually, if I could find the, it's in my computer somewhere, produced an extraordinarily fantastic leaflet. It was a bit later than the 78 Reclaim the March, but it was early 80s, a fantastic leaflet that laid out why, as feminists, the careful thought needed to be given to where you would march as a mobilization, who you would come in solidarity with, and they specifically named things like Bradford Black, which was an Asian youth organization in Bradford at the time. OK, and it was in defense of the Bradford 12, actually, uh, as I've, we're coming now and why they mobilized there as feminists. And mobilized mapping onto kind of retracing some of the steps through the very same terrains, localities that some of the reclaim the march marches has happened. But now those localities got signified in completely different ways because there was a mobilization of black people, Asian people with black allies in that sense, and wages for housework feminists saying we can do this together in solidarity. Then you remap completely. This is a remap. Shaila Shah talked about at the time the ways in which outright did a remapping of the feminist imaginary. That's the kind of stuff that was happening. It's a completely different way of doing it. And then the policing becomes we look after ourselves. We will mobilize it with the community and defend ourselves against the racist police and the fascists. So that's the sort of thing. Does that help? Whoever asked. <laughs> Hopefully it does. Thank, thank you so much, Gail. Um, we have another couple of questions. This event was uh, billed as finishing for 7.30, but is it all right with you, the speakers, if we just take a final round of, of questions? Um, so we have R Rosie Woodhouse, you have your hand up. Um, would you like to unmute yourself and um, ask your question? Um, and if anyone else has a question, if you'd like to let me know, in, I can take it as a round um, and um, and then we can finish up. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, first, thanks, everybody, for everyone's contributions. Um, I was just interested in something earlier. I think it was Sita that said, um, the difference of being accountable to the past and the difference of being accountable for the past. And I was just wondering if anyone could kind of speak to that difference and as like a strategy for moving forward, I guess, because I guess traditional notions of justice, it's about reaching a consensus that the past is done and the past is in the past, as opposed to keeping it alive in our kind of ongoing struggles for justice in the present. So, um, yeah. Um, I suppose I can speak to what I think I meant by that, which I think is that there's this notion that circulates that any discussion of the continuation of the structures of imperialist domination um, or any talk of reparations amounts to holding uh, holding the holding people accountable for things that they did not personally do. Right. This is the big sticking point. So like. Tories get very upset about it. The whole right wing gets very upset about it. How can I be held accountable for things that my grandparents did and so on and so forth? And then we, we should be attentive to that, actually. I think it's actually really important that we don't suggest that people um, should personally, they honour people are not their families and people are not their histories in, in their entirety. So I think that's actually worth saying. I don't think we can have an ethics that's based on something else. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be accountable to the past. So we have to be aware of the way in which the past acts on, enacts, animates, makes possible the present. And I think those are different things. I think being accountable for the past is an ethical project that we couldn't stand by, that I couldn't stand by, and I don't think many people could. Being accountable to the past, I think, is a different thing in that it's about what the past does in the present, about the way that the past is not past, really. You know, so we talk about empire as though it's ancient history. Empire is not ancient history. Like at the period of high colonization, a period of high decolonization, like Britain is the junior partner in the displacement of the people of the Chagos Islands so that American bases can be built there. So 
the past is really the present. And I think that that's a slightly different thing to say than people are account. People should be held responsible for what their ancestors did, which I think is a different a different matter. Um, and so I suppose what I mean by being responsible to the past is being attentive to its the ways that it animates the present and being responsible for the absolute abolition of those structures, which I think is the is the real horizon of justice. And I think um, this way in which a bit like the way that the kind of feminist project of retaining white innocence says like racism is in the past or we've already handled it. The same thing is done, of course, on a kind of massive national level, like with the, you know, erect a statue of Wilberforce kind of business. It's really the same disavowal going on, I think. Um, and so I suppose part, that's partly partly what I meant was that we shouldn't, because just because our opponents say, you want me to be responsible for things I didn't do, we shouldn't, we shouldn't reply to that by saying, yes, we do, because that's their accusation. We should actually have our own conception of accountability that we believe in and we fight for. Thanks. Thanks so much, Sita. Um, would the other panellists like to um, uh, make any closing re remarks? Um, I was just going to say a couple of words, like following on from from what Sita was just saying, and I really I really like that um, distinction between being accountable to the past rather than for the past. I find that that was really useful the way you laid that out. But I'd just like to add as well that it's like it's also about um, like what the past is is contested, and I think that that's um, and that's what we're seeing now. I mean, that's what I find like exciting about where where what decolonizing movements, what the Black Lives Matter movement in this country has opened up and um, like decolonial, like calls for decolonizing have opened up when like when they have not been like appropriated or kind of turned into just like inclusion politics, but like the kind of radical potential of like actually reckoning with a history which has been erased or sidelined and, and yeah, that's that's basically been like forgotten um, and how that like fundamentally informs the present. And I speak, and in the book, I talk about that in relation to feminism as well, right? About how it's the narratives that keep, keep like reproducing the same thing, keep um, marginalizing or erasing the history of black feminism in this country and thereby innate, like forecloses what feminism in the present can be understood to be. And so it's about, like, yeah, I think history is not history. History is like how history is a is is a always being rewritten, always being contested, and it's also like makes different kinds of presence possible. And that's why we need to keep fighting for like being accountable to those um, to those pasts that that have been erased. Thanks. Thanks so much, Therese. Um, uh, I, I've just seen in the chat that um, CT, you think you found the letter that Gail just mentioned. Is it is it a link? Um, no. OK. Um, yeah, I think then I, we'll yes. work out how to. Yeah. Great. <laughs> and if it isn't um, what I could, I could afterwards, I could, uh, it's if I fold my electric electronic file somewhere I could send it to you after some or tomorrow Sarah and then you could maybe I don't know if this how you get it round but you could post it somewhere or something it's yeah I think we'd have I think someone could help me do yeah, that yeah. yeah there'd be a way and especially because wages were so condemned by so much other bits of the WLM I mean still are now in a way but so you know really and yet they're thinking and continues to be I mean they're still active you know I still see the old people out you know um was not entirely always agreed with but raised some important points and especially about how you do coalition work mm. because they did it they did it Amazing. and as well as of course saying social reproduction has to be at the center of our politics just as yeah. production does anyway
Amazing. Um, I'm, I can't wait to read that. Um, Tanya, did you have any final? Um, sorry, no, I've put you on the spot now. Really but um, just to say that um, I thought this was brilliant and thank you so much for inviting me and um, thank you everyone for your contributions and thank you, Therese, for your book. Yes, um, so a huge virtual round of applause is, is occurring. Um, picture it, hear, hear it. Um, thank you, thank you so much. It's It's been an honour really to chair this amazing panel of um, women I admire so much. Um, and uh, yes, um, hopefully this will be a conversation that will continue first by me working out how to share that letter and um, hopefully in, in other ways as well. So thanks again uh, to all our panellists, thanks to the audience members and, um, and thank you, Therese. Thanks everyone. Thank you everyone. So